You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Welcome back to the show, folks. Shoe and Show. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, at this point, we're past Labor Day. We are looking, you may not want to, but we're looking at holidays now. We're oh, my shifting gosh. From, we're shifting from back to school. Uh, and I know there's a little bit of that going on. There's some folks out, you know, there there are some parents out there who will wait and their kid will go to school for a couple of weeks and then they'll buy. Maybe they think they get better deals. Maybe it's because the kid wants to see the fashion trends. I don't know. Mm. But for the most part, we're, we're past the back to school season. We are now entering holiday season. And Matt, as we're entering holiday season and all these conversations we get to have, I mean, it, The great thing about working at FDRA is we have this access to executives. Um, They trust us. They share what's happening in their supply chains and their costing, what they're seeing in the market. You know, we don't ever report who we're hearing from, but we try to help people see kind of the trends of the industry. From your perspective of conversations over the summer as we're ending and starting to head to the fall, what's top of mind to you in terms of the economy and consumers and product? Yeah, those are great questions, Andy. And um, we do hear a lot, right? We, there's just constant churn and constant intel flowing in. And we, we take a look at the data and we're on the weekly calls, checking in with members constantly. Um, and this has been one that's been so hard to predict because the variables have been just so numerous um, that have been outside of our control and have been historic, to be honest with you. So as those variables have subsided and gone away, we're, we're in the postmortem aftermath of what normal will look like going forward. And, and is this so, is there actual soft landing taking place as it relates to the economy? Uh, inflation, or the, at least the, the, the growth of inflation is subsiding. So prices are maybe still growing a little bit, but that growth rate has come down. Uh, the consumer's taking on more debt. That's of concern, clearly. Uh, the consumer is more discerning on pricing. So discounting is back in. Uh, we're trying to, again, shift, move through all this inventory while bringing in new inventory and placing orders for fresh product. Uh, and so all in all, I think people feel cautiously optimistic because one, retailers are typically generally optimistic uh, group of people. But secondly, I think that uh, there's still a lot of economic activity out there. Unemployment rate's still low. And that's always a driving factor. People are employed and making a paycheck. They're going to spend money. Uh, and so that's that's the thing that's hard to forecast, Andy. It's really the, the other shoe is not dropped. Let's use a shoe pun and just say we've all been waiting for the, the shoe to drop. It hasn't dropped, economically speaking. And so we're in this environment of like, uh, are we through? Are we out of the wood? Oh, to quote Taylor Swift, because it was a summer Taylor. Mm. Are we out of the woods? Are we out of the woods? Right. So that's the question. Yeah. I don't know. What was that other song she did? Like Summer Chaos or something or Cruel Summer. Cruel Summer. Oh, yeah, it's a remake from Bananarama, yep. Yeah, so that was kind of a big thing too. But, um, yeah, I think in looking at the at, at all the flip stuff, it's interesting what I heard during Fannie Market Week in August from several people. One was, uh, you know, a sourcing executive that lived in Asia for 25 years and speaks Mandarin. But the hunger of Chinese companies to get business, there, there's mm. no resistance to pushing back on price and negotiating now, right? Like, so orders are way down, and we see that in in the numbers that are, you know, all the inventory that's flowing into the U.S. from all over the world is down. So, you know, there there's this huge deflationary effect that's happening in our supply chains. We saw huge cost increases. Now it's it's not even flatness going down. And we see that with input costs. We see that with negotiation with the factories. The cost for shipping is down. Um, I will say one thing in the supply chain that I'm looking at in particular is the higher cost of shipping from warehouse to the consumer because um, when you see UPS and the labor agreement that happened, which is, is good that there is an agreement, there's not a strike, there's going to be a huge cost increase to 
shipping packages going forward. I think there was yeah. a delay in the cost of that. We see it in the holidays. So that's definitely coming up again where we, we talked about it every single holiday since COVID where it's like the holiday surcharge from FedEx, UPS, even the postal service is always higher. And there's a re the reason for that is that there, there's, you know, there's something like it starts in November, but there's like a million packages shortage per day compounding where we don't have enough delivery drivers to deliver all these packages to the houses. So mm -hmm. things get stacked up in that way, but, and that might continue, but the cost for that will increase because labor and wages have gone up. So wages going up has been a good thing to your point, right? Employment's almost full in terms of what economists expect. Yeah. Wages have gone up, which is good. So there's more spending, uh, you know, power in the pocket. Inflation's tapered down. And I would say too, the kind of hidden thing that people don't think about is house equity. So like mm -hmm. there's yeah. housing prices went up so high. There's, and we, you know, Gary always talks about housing our economists. Like it's such a bellwether because once you buy a house, you got to buy all the stuff for it. Yeah. It's like the economic, you know, it's the, it's the economist dream of, of, it's not just the mortgage, just every, it's all the, the extras, but there's more money in terms of, you know, people's, overall wealth and maybe it's not liquid but there's something to that too where i think consumers look at their savings account and are concerned but then they look at <laughs> at uh you know redfin and they see their house value went up 25 percent over the last couple of years and feel pretty good about it so mm -hmm. i think in, in terms of like this behavior uh consumer mindset you know they're getting paid more money Goods cost more. Okay, we got that. But we're, I think we're starting to let, you know, even even I go out and I look at like what I'm getting charged at a restaurant today versus what it was. And I'm like, all right, I get it. Prices went up, but hopefully we're all making more and all this stuff. So I, I think there is a churn, but I think we, not just the economy, but like the consumer mentality is starting to level out as well. So yeah. I think that's why the spending hasn't slowed because yes, their debt has gone up, but they also look at their house and they say, I can, I can take a little bit more debt on than I did in the past. There's something backing it up. Hopefully. I don't know. I think, I think you're absolutely right, Andy. And that's why just last month, Bank of America's um, global research arm came out and said, and I'm quoting, What's out, mild recession. What's in, soft landing, no recession. I'm continuing to quote here. Recent incoming data has made us reassess our prior view, and we revise our outlook in favor of a soft landing in the U.S. economy. Previously, we had forecasted a mild recession in the first half of 24. Mm. And so you have – that was the first kind of um, – the first domino to fall when Bank of America came out and basically said, Hey, psych, no recessions coming. Uh, and it's going to be a soft landing. So again, the proof's in the pudding. We'll see what the data says over the coming six months, but these are really smart people looking at really, and they have a t access to ton of data and analytics right. on consumer spending behaviors, you know, bank information, et cetera. And they're saying that a soft landing was achieved. And so that's, Again, going back to just if two or years, two or three years ago, one year ago, these things were happening to our society that none of us had ever experienced. Not one person, maybe maybe grandma, maybe great grandma did, but that was about it. it was, you could count them on one hand, and to forecast out how to navigate that. And there's so there was so much Monday morning quarterbacking of the Fed, mm -hmm. and we love to do it. We're Americans criticizing everything that that every decision the government was making. But if this thing comes out and it's been such a soft landing that it's hard to even and then no recession happens, that will actually be pretty phenomenal. And I will say that Gary constantly is looking at historically what has determined, you know, this this marker means that a recession's around the corner. And mm -hmm. this marker means that a recession's around the corner. And we've hit a number of those things. And if the recession doesn't come, then that just means we have a, the model still strong, I think, historically, but we just had all these variables that challenged the model and the model just didn't do what it was going to do typically. And I think I think we're just again, it's the postmortem. It's trying to figure out what all this all this economic data means. And 
the consumer is resilient, the super resilient. And I think uh, that that bodes well for a lot of our companies. Uh, we have seen quite a bit of cost cutting. Some of our biggest companies, some of the biggest footwear companies in the world that our members have been doing, having cost cutting exercises because mm-hmm. they've had a concern. Uh, but a lot of them are saying, hey, you know, if we get beyond the summertime into the fall, and we start to reassess our cost cutting exercises, then we might start to let some of that up. And so we're now in that period of seeing what our companies are going to decide to do relative to traveling to events, paying for certain services, coming, you know, doing other things that are a part of engaging with FDRA and other organizations. So all that to be said, there's a lot to learn, but I think it'll be really, you know, it's, I think we're in a really good place, relatively speaking to some of the things that we faced. Yeah. And that shows up in some of the conversations I had at Fannie in August as well was, you know, I was, we always ask like, how's, how are your meetings been? Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of retailers that were in market for August. So that was, it met all the expectations, people, all the brands seemed happy. Mm-hmm. Um, you ask like, how are you feeling about the economy and things? And they're saying, I'm feeling okay. Um, and we all laugh and we're like, if we had this conversation a month ago, it'd be different, right? I'd be like, I'm a little scared and, but it's okay. And okay is good in this environment. Um, especially coming off last year's huge record sales for our industry. If we're flat this year, we're flat on the record. So mm. pre COVID, we were like 85 billion, always teetering around 85 to 90 billion for total shoe sales in the U S and now we're over well over a hundred. We went from 83 to 105 billion in two, three years. There you go. There you go. And so um, I guess, uh, so we, we talked a little about, about CEO and executive mentality. I I do think there'll, there'll be kind of this movement in our industry where they're going to pause and just watch for a little bit of time through the holidays. They'll judge the holidays. So I think, Strategically, they're planning ahead for 24, but they're they're going to be very agile. They're probably going to have like three scenario planning, right? It's like <laughs> the age of like multiple scenarios. Like there's not going to be one thing. They're going to have to like, you know, be very agile in that space. So in terms of like hiring back, I just think it's going to be a little slower as they try to figure out where, where things land uh, over the next three months, six months. Um, and I, you know, I also, so we cover supply chain, kind of that mentality. So consumer mentality, I want to lean a little bit more into that too, because as holiday comes up, I think it's really important that companies maybe think about it a little bit more. Um, we, we've had these kind of stacked inventories. I mean, if you walk, I mean, you can just do it. Anybody can do it. You walk in and you'll see like, and I'm not going to mention brands, but you have 500 boxes in a store of one brand, right? Mm-hmm. It's obvious their stale product and bringing that in starts to have the discounting. And then the discounting brings in this mentality where I think holiday 2023 is going to look like it did maybe 2019, where there's going to be, you know, you need a sale. It's not gonna be a lot last year. You're going to have a, if you don't have a big red sign that says sale, they're not going to walk into the store. So I think Mm -hmm. people from the merchandising standpoint and store standpoint need to look at that and figure out like how do we how do we extend the full price longer before we start that process how do we market that how do we and and then against that i you know i do want to lean into our we did a back to school sales survey Mm. um and you can go on if you remember you can go in and take a look at that obviously we're like we said we're a little past back to school but we did that in july just to to ask families we asked a thousand families across the u.s what they were going to be thinking about for back to school. And I think that still informs the mindset, maybe not the actual spin data, but the mindset data will inform that of what we're going to see. So what the first question that was really interesting was that we asked Matt was, do you plan on using social media like Instagram, Facebook to help research and assist in your back to school shopping? So are you going to go online and see what's hot? Are your kids going to look at what's hot? And is that going to influence whether you go and buy something that's more on trend. Mm -hmm. And in 2022, 61% said, yeah, I'm going to go in there and take a look to see what's hot before we go out and start making purchases. This year that dropped to 52%. Mm -hmm. It's almost an even split. That tells me that 
for me, my gut, I read that instantly and I think snap, like that means they're looking at price. Yeah. It means they're, they're not looking at trend first, like they did last year where maybe they had more money in their, in their wallets and things. The supply chain was a little bit more squirrely and, but this year they're like, all right, like I do have a tighter budget. I am going to be led more by price. I'll probably walk into the store and look and mm-hmm. we'll make a determination based on the look and the price versus just looking around before I even like look at price tags. Yeah, I think that's right because that leads us into the next question. This is I will say that men are more are more likely to use social media than females. That's interesting to me. I don't know what you know. I don't know how to unpack that because I don't use social media that much. I use it professionally on LinkedIn. And that's it. Uh-huh. Um, and so I don't ever go online to see kind of what um, what people are wearing specifically. But I will say that to your point, seventy three percent of respondents expect to purchase shoes in store, mm-hmm. you know, the era of online forever, all the time for everybody. Well, again, in 22, 21, 22, that's gone. The empire strikes back fully in store has struck back fully. Uh, I remember even talking to Mark Warden, the CEO of shoe carnival on this podcast. We talked to Doug Howe recently from D from DVI. Um, in store is, is a huge priority growing your, your marketplace physically is important uh and the consumers are saying you know what keep doing it because we want to buy our shoes in store and i think that's that's critically important to the mentality where consumers are right now yeah and then uh and and further looking at some of those some of the family shopping habits that we saw um is around the number of pairs they plan to buy uh this year versus last year for back to school because i mean obviously if you're back to school your kid it, you know, needs it for the classroom, but maybe they're playing sports. Maybe they need it for band camp, may, you know, any number of things that they need. And kids also run through shoes really quickly. So maybe you want the extra pair so that, you know, you have that in stock. But when we looked at that, it was almost equal in terms of, uh, you know, two pairs per child. Uh, mm-hmm. Almost the majority, almost 50 percent um, said about two pairs per kid uh, this year. The drop that we saw um, is uh, is from three or more pairs, um, and that was pretty precipitous drop. You know, seven to ten percent drop that we saw. So they're not buying more. Um, they're buying near the same as last year for one or two pairs, but they're not adding that extra pair, which I think is completely logical. And we talked about that, where you know, uh, mom may go and even shop for herself, and instead of buying two pairs, she's buying one now because it's a, a more budget conscious. Mm-hmm. But also the price range. Again, that feeds back into that narrative around what, you know, pre um, looking on social media for trend versus price. But we look and see like in 2022, like 41% were looking for shoes that were $60 or under. So more price conscious. And this year that went up um, to 53%. So what's interesting than- now, Andy, is that you could probably get more deals now. I know you can get more deals, right? A lot more discounting, as you said, that that 40% off in the in the window draws people in again. We had a that was a thing for about a decade. Then we had a respite where everything was full price during COVID, and now we're back to where we were with discounting. And in reality, you could get it's cheaper to get more pairs of shoes based on some of the discounting activity. I would think, yeah. But people are obviously concerned about how far they're going to stretch their budgets this year. Yeah, and then kind of the last point that I that I'll point to this is because it will lead us into into the holiday. I, and I've said it, I think I said it last year. Cause I think a lot about this seasonally, there are some, there's some kind of cognitive switch in consumers where when the heat dis- dissipates and you start to feel a little bit of a, a cold wind, like that's the end of summer and you kind of peel back and that changes, I think consumer behavior a little bit in the summer. We're out more, uh, you know, we were traveling, we're doing that stuff you start to hit post labor day, the kids are back in school. There's more of a fixed schedule. You're not out as much hope, you know, in terms of our industry, hopefully you're saving that money. I think what will be interesting. And I would say from my perspective, uh, executives that are planning ahead should look at travel industry, meaning like what's happening with hotels or with planes are, are Americans still spending in that space or are they, constraining themselves in the fall compared to the summer 
Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, that means that they are hoarding more money instead of just freely spending it. And possibly for shoes, that's a good thing, I would argue. Uh, I don't think it's, you know, I think it's, you know, part of saving a little bit of money from September, October, and then hitting into the holidays. If they do that, they may have more, uh, pay down more debt, have more spending power for the holidays. And I think holidays this year, my personal opinion will do quite well for footwear, like quite well in this environment, like 2%, 3% growth uh, Mm -hmm. would be my estimate. And some people are going to, and I'm an, I'm optimistic on that. Some people are going to say it'll be flat, but what tells me that a little bit is the, one of the last questions we asked these families. And it was even with all these price kind of indicators that we see, right? They're spending less per pair. They're buying less pairs or more price conscious, Are you planning on spending more for back to school shoes this year than last year? Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting question because last year, obviously there was no discounting really. There was like limited inventory people, inflation was super high. Right. So, so uh, in 2022, um, most people, 44% said, I'm going to spend the same in 2022 as I did in 2021, 36% because of inflation expected to pay more. So you have this balance in 2023, even with the price conscious folks, 42% said they were planning on spending more, mm-hmm. even with inflation dissipating. So it tells me they're just more meticulous about their decisions. It doesn't mean that they're pulling back the spending. It just yeah. means like, they're, you know, the, this behavioral economics is like, I want to feel like I'm watching my budget, but at the same time, if I spend more, okay, that's okay. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Yeah, it's 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 it is interesting that there's an expectation that people are gonna are gonna spend more this year. Um, I'm and I'm optimistic about holiday too as well, Andy. And you're a guy I buy way more shoes than you do. You're way more discerning on on what you spend your money on. Uh, and if you're optimistic, I mean that means it's like gonna be a phenomenal <laughs> holiday season. So. Um, I, I will say beyond holiday though, and we're political guys by nature, um, we're entering into a presidential election year and where people are going to dog the economy for like a year straight until we get to the election. So it would be quite interesting to see how that impacts consumer mentality heading into 24 because it's going to be all mm-hmm. the gloves are off. It's going to be a tumultuous year next year. It's going to be like an election we've never had in our lifetimes because of all the legal uh, challenges to the former president, President Trump, and then the expectation he'll be the nominee on the Republican side. Uh, and I think the consumer is going to be just bombarded with chaos. And I'll yeah. be quite interested to see how they can emotionally navigate that. Maybe they buy more shoes to kind of ease the pain, <laughs> but I don't know, man. I'm not optimistic. When, I, 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 yeah, I think you're right. I think right now people feel better than they thought they were going to feel. Yeah, that's a good way. So it, it's almost a stoic mentality where you're like expecting the worst. And when it doesn't happen, you're like, oh, like mm-hmm. things are. So there, there's a euphoria that's probably more than what we should have, you know, in our in, in the in the economy of, of happiness. Like people should be a little I think people should be more cautious than they are, which is a good thing for sales. Right. Mm-hmm. Like That's a good thing for sales. Just personally, I hope people are paying down their debt um, and and watching their budget a little bit more tightly. But the feeling is going to be good. But to your point, yes, when when we start to see people actually vote starting next year and those ads start running out, then that's going to be challenging that optimism a little bit more and it's going to ding against it. But for now, all the all the narrative of the media is pushing out, which influences people whether they think it or not. And they're in, in their mind, like it's all positive stuff that's being talked about. Yeah. Flat is positive, right? So we have that. I would just say for for the political side, and I think we all can agree, this is the one thing we can all agree on. I don't think anyone over the age of 80 should be running for any public office at this point. I'm sorry, but <laughs> from Diane Feinstein not knowing where she is in the committee, from Mitch McConnell freezing up, like just go home and be with your family. Um, but also just Trump and, and Biden are also really old guys. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, and, and I, it, Trump may argue he has more like vitality or something like that, but like age is a, is a funny thing. 
vitality doesn't matter, but the age all of a sudden can shift really quickly on you, right? Like as you get older. So I just, it, I think we look at this and younger generation has got to be scratching their head and being like, God, like, don't we, don't we have any, we went from like a Barack Obama who was relatively young to mm-hmm. this kind of, this kind of state of affairs. And like, do we really want people who are 80 years old making decisions for middle income Americans who are in their thirties and forties? Like that's a, it's an, it, it's a completely different age uh, in, in life, but also a completely different age in the politics. <laughs> I agree. So, I agree. I, I will say this. Um, and I've noticed it even in, 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 in with an industry that people hang on, uh, for a really long time. Cause they're often afraid, you know, if I retire, I'm going to die. That is a mentality, particularly for men. I've noticed it with a number of executives that I've been friends with over the years. And, um, and there's just a, it reeks of desperation to be in your eighties and pushing 90 and still in the, in the government. It, it really does. Like I, this is my identity. I can't walk away from it. Um, I have to have access to power. I have to be in a position of power. And I remember distinctly having worked in the Bush administration, president Bush said in an interview, I knew the gig was up when I had a little doggy bag on my hand and I was picking them after Barney on my lawn. Like I knew like the power game was over. Right. And he went off and he did that very graciously. And there's a lesson to be learned there, particularly if you're 89 years old and you don't know, you know, what your name is and you're, and you're in the, in the U S Senate. I just think that it just, we need, we need, we need this generation to kind of migrate off of the seat of power very, you know, sooner rather than later, because you're right. It doesn't behoove us as a, as a country to have these choices um, and I think no one's satisfied with them and it creates yeah. a lot of tumult, right? Amongst the people because well, it's look, no good look, options. It can, it can happen gracefully. Bush did it. Obama did it. Yep. Trump did. No, Trump did not do it. Um, mm-hmm. Pelosi did though. Pelosi did relinquish being speaker. And yeah. you know, obviously they, they, there was a changeover in power, but being the democratic leader for as long as she could, she could have kept doing that. I don't, I think she would have won the caucus. Sure. I'm good for her again, but she stepped aside. So there is that. But I, I do think if we can if we can stop yelling at each other and listen to each other, I think starting point is 80 is the, the limit. Nothing above it, right? So like we can debate that too on the age stuff, but I just think that would be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is just a quick hit from from what we're thinking about and what we're hearing. We appreciate you guys listening to us as always. Drop us a line with any feedback you have. Uh, if you have any topics or guests you want us to, to talk to, let us know. We're, we're happy to take a look at that. Um, and as always, we we go through a lot of this stuff on our Tuesday calls. Matt has a newsletter that goes on every single Monday to the industry. It is one of the most dynamic newsletters you'll get on what's happening in the industry because he talks to dozens of CEOs every single week and he reports out what the trend lines are uh, from them. So it's intelligent sharing. We don't share who it is. But it's vital information to confirm what you think or challenge what you think you know. Um, and so if you're not getting that, drop us a line and we'll add that. It's called uh, it's called What I'm Hearing. Uh, and uh, and I think, you know, our open rates on that are, matter about 50 percent, which is which is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, people send me intel unsolicited on stuff. You know, I'll put a point out there and people want to. They interact with it very dynamically. So it's it's a fun thing to do every week. I'm taking a, you know, I just took a break in August, but we're back at it now in September. And uh, I'm, I'm excited. To, so if you got if you got intel, send it to me. I'm all ears. Absolutely. And folks, as always, shoeandshow.com is the website. We appreciate you listening. Um, wishing you well as we enter into the fall season and, uh, and holiday season. And we know budgets are tight still. We know sales are, you know, people are a little bit nervous. Um, I think we can be a little bit more optimistic, but we have to be more focused, I guess, is the message from today. Consumers will be more meticulous. They'll hopefully spend more. But they'll be more meticulous about the spin. And I think as an industry, we just need to, to recognize that and be more focused around that. And if you do that, I think I think holiday can be actually better than what we think. Um, and that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping people get me a lot of gifts. If you would like to get me a gift, I'll provide you my uh, my address. Uh, Matt and I are both size 12. So happy, happy to receive and, and test your product and give you feedback. 
uh, honest yeah. open feedback. So just drop drop us a line and let us know if you're interested. We're happy to receive gifts. Absolutely. And then we'll provide um, feedback on the podcast about how awesome your product is. Exactly. We have we're no ethics, we have no ethics disclosures <laughs> like the Supreme Court justices. We have no issues with that, right? So we are ungoverned and unchecked, and we appreciate the ability to serve the industry as unchecked and uh, yeah, right. But yeah. rest assured, we will not be in these jobs in, in <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, thanks for listening as always. Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.